Good morning, everybody. Um, that was a weak wave. I'm gonna do that again. I'm hitting the reset button on that. Uh, I hope everybody's having a happy Saturday. Uh, our sun is all over the place, so we apologize for the glare. Uh, we didn't think it would be that bad. Um, and as this is my very first time ever in front of a camera, I thought I'd wear a really white reflective shirt because um, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so our apologies for the glare. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, that heat wave we had here in Calgary finally broke. Um, and it was, it was pretty bad. Uh, I've been uh, asked by a number of people, um, customers uh, on social media, family, friends, colleagues, um, that their garden isn't doing great. Um, they're seeing sun damage. They're seeing heavy wilt, even though things are watered. All kinds of uh, kooky things going on. And it's fine. As long as the plant, you know, isn't totally done for, uh, it'll be fine. Like a lot of us, a lot of people, uh, a lot of pets, um, that heat wave hit uh, and we weren't ready. We had no uh, climatization going on. Uh, and it floored a lot of people. So uh, the heat wave has broke. Uh, we're meant to be getting some showers, uh, some warmth, fantastic. The gardens should bounce back. Um, but one thing that, uh, you know, tend to weather uh, these weather fluctuations really nicely are trees. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, and this is our second webinar on trees. And our first one, uh, we kind of focused primarily on uh, new trees and planting. Uh, and if you want to see that, that is up on our blog post. Uh, Brandy always posts them. The videos go onto the YouTube channel um, and the blog post goes onto our website and everything is linked. You can find everything. Um, and we talked about planting. So uh, I thought we'd do a recap on kind of what trees are, what we're discussing exactly. Uh, and then we would talk more about uh, with this weather we've had, uh, with summer coming up, uh, what we can do for our trees, how we can maintain uh, overall tree health uh, and make sure that our trees are in the best possible condition uh, to survive anything that might come our way. Uh, extended periods of drought, uh, really hot weather, uh, early snowfall, uh, frosts, late frosts, early frosts, uh, and then going into the winter. So we're going to try and encompass all of that. As always, um, if you have any questions, sorry, rookie mistake, we were too busy dealing with everything. I'm just going to turn my ringer off. Um, if you have any questions uh, regarding um, comprehension, if I'm talking about something and you're not getting it, because I'm not explaining myself well, uh, which I sometimes don't, uh, please interrupt. Brandy will interrupt me, no problem. Uh, but if you have a question just regarding your trees or your gardens or general knowledge, if we can save them till the end, there will be time for Q&A. Uh, and we'll, we'll get on all of that. We'll answer all of your questions. So firstly, what is a tree? Uh, I've got three here. I got an ash, I got a juniper, I got a cherry. They're all trees. They're all very different. So in the broad stroke definition, uh, a tree is a perennial, meaning it comes back every year, or we hope it does. Uh, you know, it gets hit by lightning or cracks in two from a snowstorm. It may not come back, but for the most part, in the right conditions, a tree will come back every year. But what differentiates it when we're discussing perennials, meaning uh, herbaceous ones, uh, spurge, uh, columbine, echinacea, sedum, those ones. Trees are normally defined as having a central woody trunk or stem that supports branches, twigs, flowers, and fruits. It also has an intense root system. Um, and that's essentially what a tree is. Obviously then if you start getting down into uh, fruits and pitted fruits, you start talking about uh, conifers, 
and you start talking about uh, hardwoods and softwoods. There's so many interchangeable moving parts, but to cover the broad strokes, that's what a tree is. And the parts of a tree are really, really, you know, kind of self-explanatory. Because we have sun and it's quite warm in here, I'm not gonna take any of them out of their pots, but I think we all understand what a root system is. This here is our trunk or our stem, comes up and it supports branches. In turn, the branches support twigs, and in turn, those twigs support leaves and fruits. So that's kind of all of the, uh, all of the parts, and they're all essential. You know, uh, they can be a, a part, like say the twig. All the twig does is contain all of the capillaries and veins that allow photosynthesis that happens in the leaf, which is basically uh, turning uh, gas carbon dioxide uh, into energy and then outputting oxygen. And that travels down the stem, which contains all of the heart, uh, the heart wood, not necessarily hard wood, um, which goes to the root system, which uptakes all of the nutrients, which keeps the leaves healthy so they can go through photosynthesis. So that's how all the parts work. And then you got the parts like the fruit, which take from the tree, but they don't really give anything back. Um, but the tree is essentially doing that for propagation. Uh, it so happens we can eat these cherries, and that is fantastic. But that wasn't the purpose of them. These cherries form so that this tree has propagated itself. Much like any other species on the planet, self-propagation is the goal. Uh, we can just eat them, so yay us. So that's kind of the parts of the trees. And then the two main classifications are conifer, which can be a juniper, uh, a larch, um, spruce, pine, um, or deciduous. We got a cherry, birch, oak, maple, ash. The main difference, conifers are mostly evergreen, uh, primarily meaning they retain their needles. So when you walk past a yard, uh, middle of winter, when you see a big green tree, chances are it's a conifer, unless it happens to be a larch, which is a deciduous conifer. They are very, the, the larch itself isn't red, but deciduous conifers are. Uh, conifers bear cones, that's in the name. Conifer simply means cone bearing. Uh, they tend to be more of the softwood. I think we've all heard about softwood, hardwood, trade disputes, and I am certainly not getting into that. Uh, but that's kind of spruce is the first one that comes to mind for a lot of people when we discuss that. And because their leaves are needles, those needles are a leaf, they tend to be more drought tolerant because of the gas exchange to it. So now that, that doesn't mean that they don't need water. It doesn't mean that every single one is drought tolerant. I am always talking here broad strokes. We don't have enough time. I could do a full uh, one hour presentation on just conifers. Uh, I could probably do a one hour uh, presentation on junipers, on just spruce. There's enough information uh, out there about them, but we don't have enough time. Uh, and nobody wants me to be talking about, you know, a cherry tree in February. Doesn't really fit the mood. So we're really condensing things here. Um, and then a deciduous, so I'll use my cherry, or like I said, my ash tree here, they tend to shed their leaves. So we've all seen that in the fall, everything turns golden or red or brown, uh, and the leaves fall. They tend to have a broadleaf foliage, needle broadleaf, so it's a much wider leaf, um, better exchange of gases, hence why they tend to grow a little quicker because they can get more energy uh, through the photosynthesis. Uh, they tend to bear flowers, cones don't. They put out cones, which are a whole other um, classification. Uh, they bear flowers, which in turn turn to fruits. We're gonna discuss that next. Uh, they tend to be more the hardwoods, oak, First one that comes to mind again, if you think of the uh, hardwood, softwood uh, trade disputes we have going on. Uh, and they tend to prefer more moist areas uh, because of that broader leaf, uh, a broader um, surface for a gas exchange, more photosynthesis, they can require water because there's just simply more energy happening. And an essential part of photosynthesis is water. Which is a lot of times uh, when you see that, when we have a whole section coming up on watering, when they've been underwatered, the leaf will often curl in on itself and sag down. 
essentially reducing its footprint. So it's limiting its own uh, process of photosynthesis to preserve energy. So again, those are the broad strokes. Um, and then, Grandy, I put my slides out of order, my apology. Um, what I have here is, uh, is it a fruit tree or a flowering tree? So every, and we already talked about this on GA Kids TV. And every flowering tree produces a fruit. Every fruit tree produces a flower. So the delineation of what each one is kind of gets muddied. And that's, you know, kind of what I said at the beginning, having to talk broad strokes here, because we could do entire shows just devoted to this. And indeed, people do. I mean, you know, there's arborists, there's, there's people that specialize only in trees uh, for a good reason. They're massively diverse and massively important. But when we talk about what is a, a fruit tree and what's a flowering tree, so we have, and if I move, everything's going to fall over, but it won't be the first time, told you, and it won't be the last time. So I'm going to move my evergreen very quickly. Thank you, Brandy. And we can see here, uh, we have a mountain ash. Now this blooms and it puts out a bright red berry. I think we've all seen that uh, around Calgary uh, in the fall. And I think this one has some immature berries, does. So right there, that is a fruit, okay? Now this guy, unfortunately, uh, it only has dead flowers, which are here, but it flowered. Now those flowers are turning into the cherries that we can see here, they're edible for us. The other ones are edible for birds. So although both of them blossom and both of them fruit, when we talk flowering tree, we're specifically talking about a tree that flowers, but we don't eat the fruit. And when we're talking about a fruit tree, we're talking about a tree that flowers, but we do eat the fruit. And that's a really broad stroke uh, classification because a lot of times people will say, oh, I want a flowering tree. Um, and we'll say, oh, a cherry tree or an apple tree. And they go, oh, no, 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 I don't want uh, a fruit. I, I don't have time to harvest or I'm not interested. But, oh, no problem. So then we take from here and then we'll get people who come in and they go, oh my God, my neighbor's got this most amazing tree and it's got white flowers all over it. Uh, what is it? We say it's an apple tree. And they go, oh my God, that's incredible. It gives me apples too. So that's how we kind of classify them in the broad strokes. So in a nutshell, uh, that is what trees do. And as for what trees bring to us, uh, anybody who's been following my webinars, you've noticed on really hot days, I tend to drink hot coffee. <laughs> Brandy brought me an iced coffee because she's wonderful. Thank you, Rosso. Oat milk, dirt coffee, yeah. happy column. It also helps with my throat as I'm projecting my voice. Um, but trees, they're invaluable for a number of reasons, uh, at least not noise reduction. Uh, a lot of us work, a lot of us work hard. We go home uh, and we want some solace. We want some refuge. And, you know, people drive cars, uh, motorbikes. Uh, kids play next door and they're splashing and they're shouting. Your friends next door are having a barbecue and they didn't invite you. Bad friends. Um, your friends next door, they might be having a barbecue and they're talking, playing music. That's all great. Sounds of summer. We love it. We might not want to hear it. Fantastic noise reduction. And the evergreens, your spruce trees, are great for that in the winter where sound carries more because there's less reduction on the other trees. They're also incredible for soil integrity with that massive root system. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and and the, the structure of the root system really holds us all together. Trees, because of how substantial their growth is, if they're watered for and cared for properly, their root system is immense. And that helps with any kind of soil erosion, but it also helps with moisture retention. Uh, you ever walk through the forest on a hot day, everything else is dry and the ground under the trees still feels cool and damp, they're shading it out. So the sun can't steal all of that moisture. Um, their roots are holding it there because it can't percolate all the way through. 
because there's a barrier and the roots are doing that so they can drink it as they need it. So it's great for that. Temperature control. A big tree can keep the sun off your house in the summer and it can stop that minus 40 wind hitting you in the winter. It's amazing for that. Privacy, okay. Uh, that comes in with a noise reduction. Um, you know, maybe you have a hot tub, maybe you, uh, maybe you want to sunbathe topless, whatever it might be. You have those trees up, you're preventing people from seeing you. You've got your own little, you know, refuge where you can just sit, it's quiet, you can't be seen by anybody, and you can enjoy mental health. Uh, and this has only been talked about uh, in the last few years. Um, and it is so, so, so important. Uh, they have proven um, trees, being around trees, sitting under trees, eating fresh fruit from a tree, caring for a tree can help. And I'm always going to say this, in no way, shape or form do I ever believe that getting out in nature or being around a tree is going to cure depression, anxiety, uh, PTSD, whatever, but it can help. And that's all that I'm saying is that it can help. And if it can alleviate some of your stresses, that's a good thing. Um, as always, um, you know, personally and professionally, we do care very much about mental health. Big shout out to everybody who's dealing with it. Uh, mad respect and mad love. Um, but trees can actually help with that. It has been proven. Uh, just being around trees, the green, it's a, that green room in theaters, it's a soothing color for us. Our brain, you know, gets some serotonin from seeing that. So they're amazing for that. Aesthetic, just beauty. How many, I don't know about you guys, maybe it's the people I follow, but my Instagram gets littered in the spring with people taking pictures of leaves unfurling, flowers coming out on trees. People get so excited about that. And there is nothing wrong with planting a tree purely for aesthetic. I'm listing all these other reasons. You might be going, eh, eh. It's pretty. That is a great reason. In and of itself, that is an amazing reason to put in a tree. And last, but by no means least, food. We grow it. We get all of those benefits I just mentioned. And you can pick a fresh apple from your tree. So trees have a massive inherent value um, to, you know, how we live our lives, how we enjoy our spaces and whatnot. And they can also uh, add value to a property. Um, absolutely. But again, that is out of my league. I'm not real estate. I'm not going to talk about hardwood, uh, softwood, lumber disputes. I'm not an economist. I'm a horticulturist. So I talk about the plant nerdy stuff that I love. Okay. And I assume since you're watching me, that's what you're doing too. So we got our trees. And like I said, we're not talking about the new ones that's on the blog post and on the YouTube. We have mature trees in our yard. How do we care for them? What steps? do we need to do now to make sure that our trees are gonna be covered for the spring and the summer? And there's five pretty easy steps. And if you don't know them, they can be intimidating. Uh, they can also be, if you don't know, you don't know you're not doing something wrong. You know, Don't beat yourself up for something you didn't know yesterday. Um, it's all about learning. I learn something new every single time I do one of these presentations. Uh, I learn something new. Um, Brandy and I always talk about it after Brandy tells me that she learned something. Brandy will ask me a question and it'll force me to answer something. So learning is fantastic. So if you've got a tree and you haven't done one of these, all of these, whatever, it doesn't matter. We're just giving you the tips now. So it's pruning, inspecting, fertilizing, watering, and mulching. It doesn't have to be in that order. That's just the order they occurred to me. So that's why I put them down. So let's go through these steps. So pruning, make sure it's the correct time to prune. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, it's spring, everything's coming out, the leaves are coming out. You're like, ooh, I'm gonna prune my cherry tree. I'm gonna cut this branch. You just lost all these cherries, every single one of them. You're not gonna get them because you've just trimmed off your flowers. Now, the tree is probably going to sucker as well because you cut it at the wrong time. So you want to prune um, a cherry tree, a fruit tree, ideally late fall, early winter. A lilac, I know people who, uh, I don't get it. My lilac never blossoms. I do everything right. I prune it every spring. 
you just cut off all your flower tips. Lilacs, prune them after they're done flowering. So what you want to do is you want to learn what tree you're dealing with because it's not a one size fits all. If in your garden, uh, you've got an ash tree, a cherry tree and a juniper, okay? You might not be able to go out and this drives me nuts. I, uh, I thrive on efficiency and time management. Uh, I say I thrive on, what I should say is I suck at them, but I thrive on them. Uh, and when I go out to do a job, I want to do it all. Uh, last weekend when we planted, uh, Saturday, all the prep work, bam, 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 methodical. Sunday, everything laid out. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, everything. That's the way my gardener's brain goes. I go out, I want to prune all my trees, but I can't. So you need to learn uh, the times. And, and again, I can't get into every single tree. If you have a tree and you're like, oh, when should I prune it? Hit us up with a DM, come in and see our tree lot, call our tree lot, we'll sort you out. Always use clean, sharp tools. Uh, get a new pair if you need to. Uh, take them apart. You can see they're all put together with screws and everything. Wash them. Uh, vinegar, um, vinegar baking soda mix works really well. Hydrogen peroxide is another good one. Uh, clean them off. Make sure they're sharp. When you're cutting a branch, and I've been guilty of this, I'm too busy, I don't get around with, uh, sharpening them. Cut a branch with a dull blade and you end up tearing it. You want a clean cut when you're cutting. Remember the five Ds that you're pruning for. And this is gonna tie into my first point. So your five Ds are dead, diseased, damaged, dangerous, and then desirable. So if you're looking at a tree, and I grabbed this tree specifically, I got a dead branch here. This tree's in fruit, it's flowered, there's tons of things happening. I said it's not the right time to prune it, I'm gonna clean that off, it's dead. If I don't take that off and clean it properly, what can happen now is pathogens, infections can get into an open wound, much like us, okay? An open wound isn't a good thing. It needs to be taken care of. Uh, if you're like, oh, now's not a good time. I have to go grocery shopping. I'll get to my open wound later. Everybody's gonna be like, oh, no, that's not a good idea. You need to deal with it now. Same thing. So if you're looking, you've got a branch and it's a big branch and it's overhanging your greenhouse, you might want to take it off regardless of the time of year. Because if that gets a windstorm and that branch has any kind of damage in it and it comes down, then you've lost your greenhouse and the branch came off anyway, and you're going to have to go up and prune because of the damage. So always keep an eye out for them. The one that you prune for is desirable. So you clean off your dead, disease, damage, dangerous. Then you're like, oh, I want to shape it. That's the one that you wait for. Okay. So always remember those five Ds. And again, you guys don't have to be scribbling this down or making notes. Brandy will have it up as a blog post. And this video will be on YouTube. And always cut to the color of bud. And we're going to talk more about that on the next slide. Um, it's... Those are terms, and, and you'll understand what I mean when we show it to you. And do not use paint if you prune correctly. Um, I still see people do it, and we sell it. But we sell it because sometimes, uh, if there's a dangerous branch, for an example, and you can't prune it properly, which is cutting to the collar of the bud, we're going to show you that, and you have to leave out a stump like this, you may need to cover it to stop an infection getting in. That's where it's to be used. If you prune properly, it does not need to be painted, sealed, or anything. So let's discuss that. So pruning to the collar. Every branch, see if I can lift this one into you guys. I'm going to pick the smaller one because quite frankly, I am a very lazy man. So this branch here, I'm going to lift it in closer to the camera. And what I want you to notice is where that branch comes out from the stem, you're going to see a slight swelling. It's only maybe quarter of an inch, maybe quarter of an inch, but you'll see it. It'll be slightly discolored and slightly swollen. So I'll bring that to the camera. So that's what we call the collar. Every branch has them. Now, when we get into the twigs, that's why we're going to look for buds. That comes up next. And if you look at the picture, that shows how to prune it. You don't want to leave it an inch, half an inch out from the collar. 
and you don't want to cut through the collar right where the collar ends so right where that swelling tapers that's where you want to cut it and the reason for that is as that new branch was forming the collar formed around it and then the branch came out that collar contains a ton of enzymes and all the good stuff it needs to protect from any damage so when you cut back to that the tree is immediately healing itself sealing itself and preventing uh, bugs uh, and disease and anything else from getting into it. So when you say cut to the collar, it doesn't mean through the collar and it doesn't mean slightly away. If you can, and again, this is what I'm talking about pruning correctly. You get your pruners, you get in there, you snip, you're done. That's it. If you can't, if you look at that first picture where it says incorrect stuff, that's where you want to use a pruning paint or paste same with the second one incorrect flush cuts where you've cut right into the uh, right into the trunk or the stem or the main supporting branch then you might want to cover it and it's not great it is not great that is an unnecessary wound for the tree but sometimes we have no choice i've had to do it before uh, i've had all the tools uh, i can easily get into it but there's been other factors that haven't allowed me to do a proper cut and i've had to do it and had to protect it then some of our smaller branches like this, okay? Maybe I'm cutting for desirable and I don't want this branch getting much longer. So I want to trim it back. Or instead of it coming out like this, I want to cut to this bud because now I want it to go up. I'm shaping it, I'm pruning it. I'm doing what I desire. So the five Ds, okay? And that's how you want to cut. So you can see the far right and the far left are the good examples and everything in between is a bad example. Um, if you cut too angular, again, you're kind of leaving uh, too much of a stem, that new branch is gonna come out. If you haven't really triggered the growth. If you cut too low, well, you've cut behind the bud, so you've taken out some of those veins that are gonna feed it. So now that new bud isn't getting all the food it wants. You've cut too high. Well, now you've left what a stub cut again, uh, so you've left your tree open and susceptible to damage. If you have one bud, a 45 degree angle, the bottom of your cut should be level with your bud. Okay, math, we're getting into triangles, people. Okay, Pythagorean theorem. Okay, the next slide is all about uh, triangles, math. I'm just kidding, it's not at all. <laughs> I, uh, I wouldn't be good at that either. So we've established I'm not an economist. Uh, I'm not a mathematician. <laughs> Today, basically, I'm going to uh, summarize what I am not. Okay. And then if you've got two buds that you're pruning to, you want to just do a nice straight cut level with both the buds, just a little bit higher so you don't undercut or you break your buds up. That's how you prune to a bud. So that is uh, pruning. And again, uh, if you have a question or you're unsure, you can always take a picture. The amount of people that come in, uh, start talking to us and they go, oh, wait a second. And they bust out their phone and they start, you know, showing us things on their phone or they DM Brandy pictures. So we, we get it all the time. And that's wonderful. It's a lot easier for us to answer with a visual because then we can talk about your specific tree. Um, and then inspect. Um, you want to go out and put eyes on your tree. And I've listed the things you're looking for, but you can look for them all at the same time. And you don't have to, you know, get right in or climb the tree. Again, you're doing an overview and you're looking for any kind of disease. You're looking for a, a powdery mildew, a, a white spot. Are you looking for black spot? Clue is in the name, a black spot on your leaf. Rust, a brownish rust colored looking spot. All of the common fungicides, black knot, it's a big black gnarly growth that normally forms on branches like this right here. See it in all of the city parks. Uh, look for insects, good or bad. Uh, you may see a ton of ladybirds uh, in your tree and you're like, yeah, I got ladybirds. They're probably there because you have aphids and you haven't seen the aphids. Aphids are tiny and green, ladybugs are fat, sassy and red. A lot easier to spot. So that's what you want to look for. A good bug can tell you, oh, you've also got a bad bug. 
So you want to make sure, uh, you know, what insects have you got? You see one or two spiders, you're doing fine. Probably a good spot for them. Flies are flying in between. Your tree is covered in spiders, probably telling you you got aphids. So always keep an eye out uh, for the insects you have. Look at the overall structure, stand back. Make sure it's not growing lopsided. Make sure you don't have a big branch sticking up. You can look at a tree from this angle and be like, oh my God, that's amazing. Come around to this angle and be like, oh my God, there's a huge branch coming out. So always kind of just do a 360, look for structure, look for anything that's really off balance or any kind of deficiencies. And that ties into the next point, test branch strength. Okay, and I don't mean reef on the branch. You might see a branch and you're like, oh, I'm not sure about that. You just give it a bend. That's bending. I'm not folding it over. Easy peasy bending. This branch, oh, it snapped. Okay, and I knew it would. This again, why I picked this tree. Um, very easily snapped. So I know that that branch is not good. It's either dead or dying and it needs to be fixed. So test some branches, make a look uh, around the whole thing. Uh, and you're just looking for structure or things that seem off. Um, look for abnormal growth. You might have a huge cluster of leaves somewhere. Sucker growth coming up. These are all indicators that something might need to be done and it might need to be addressed. It can be uh, anything from a fertilizer deficiency to a disease, to a blight, to having been pruned at the wrong time. So it's suckered. So you want to keep an eye out for that. Look for signs of stress and drought. Uh, stress can be, uh, you have a tree, we hear horror stories like this all the time. Uh, the neighbor is doing work and they have construction equipment driving over. After a month, a few weeks, a year, uh, those roots that were under the grass where the construction machine were driving over have been damaged. Now the tree is stressing, okay? It might be a cool day, you've given it lots of water, but it still looks like it's wilting. So you really want to keep an eye out for that. Keep an eye out for any drought, which is just, the tree's like, hey man, I need a drink. Can you help me out here? It's been a long day. You know, you're sitting on your deck having a drink. Why doesn't he get one too? So you want to keep an eye out for that. And then always look out for dangers. Um, a branch falling, um, fruit that you're not harvesting, you haven't paid attention to, your backyard is now full of wasps. Those are the kind of things that you want to look for. And again, when you're out and you're watering and you're fertilizing and you're pruning, that's when you're looking for this. Uh, or when you go out and you're just enjoying it, okay? It doesn't hurt to keep an eye on it and give it a little bit of baby. Fertilize it. Uh, a lot of people uh, somewhat neglect fertilizing their trees. They'll fertilize their tomatoes, uh, they'll fertilize their lawn, uh, but their trees, they, they, oh, it's a big tree, it doesn't need anything. Kind of does. Uh, that big tree, in order to grow, especially fruit trees, high production trees, uh, it takes a lot of energy, a lot of sunlight, a lot of water, a lot of nutrition, and they get that from the soil. So they're permanently depleting the natural nutrition, replenishing the fertilizers. Even a big mature tree you fertilize, it might not get it immediately, like say a tomato in a pot, but it will get it eventually because you're just enriching the soil with those minerals, nutrients, and salts, and it's gonna drink it up. Use a suitable fertilizer. So what I mean by that, don't use a lawn fertilizer on your tree. Don't use a tomato fertilizer. You're giving it kind of the wrong nutrients. Get a tree fertilizer, okay? And there's any number, or you go with an all purpose. Can't go wrong. And you want to stop your fertilizing uh, mid-August. And, and the reason I kind of say it like that depends on the season. Um, you might want to stop it a bit earlier. You might want to push it a bit longer. Ideally, though, you don't want to be encouraging new growth uh, going into the fall because a hard frost can nip that and burn your branches back. So beginning of August, middle of August is when you might want to wrap up your fertilizing. And use the fertilizer that best suits your lifestyle. Uh, if you're going to be home all summer, um, you know that you don't have any vacations planned. Uh, you're planning on going to, you know, Mexico in the, in the spring or in the winter or something like that. 
they're going to be in the yard. Maybe you want to use a water soluble. You do it every week, every two weeks, uh, and you water it, watering can, applicator, and you feed the tree that way. Maybe you're gone. Maybe you're going to uh, uh, go to Europe or the cabin, um, and you want to put in a fertilizer spike. You put them around the tree based on the instructions. Or maybe you're busy or absent-minded like me, and you want to just hit it with a shake and feed. Okay, it's granular, it breaks down when it waters, rains, and in the warm. So suit the one that works best for your lifestyle. Personally, I like water soluble. That's the one I'm always gonna go with. Um, and what I do is I do mine every other Sunday. Okay, and the reason I do that is because like I said, I am absent-minded. If I don't memorize that I do it on Sundays, every other Sunday, then I, I, I will forget and I'll either over-fertilize or under-fertilize. Neither of that is good, okay? And do not over-fertilize. I know a lot of people go, oh, if one liter is good, two liters must be better. Think about if you're sick and your doctor gives you penicillin and says, take one pill a day. You don't go, well, if one pill is good, two must be better. You go, oh, he knows what he's doing. He's treating my infection. I'm going to take one a day. Kind of the same thing. Don't over uh, do it because I know a lot of people do that. They get good results, but they end up with too much growth and it's unsustainable. So really be careful with that. And then watering. And this is another thing people can tend to neglect. And a lot of times on mature trees, they may not need water. Maybe they found a water source underground. Maybe they never go into wilt. Fantastic. That's one. That's that's the goal. That's what we want our trees to do. But you might have a mature tree, uh, maybe five years old, seven, ten, and it hasn't quite found that water yet. And on really hot days in the summer, we haven't had rain in three weeks. Every day the temperature is high 20s, low 30s, and you see your leaves, like I said, go into that wilt. They curl in a bit and they drop down. They're trying to limit their exposure. They don't have the strength in the cell wall to stand up. It's not good. That's when you want to water it. Try not to use a sprinkler uh, for your trees. Sprinklers are great for, for flower beds, uh, lawns, stuff like that. They're not great for a tree because it comes down and then it goes away. You waste a lot of water. The tree doesn't get to absorb a lot. A lot of it lands on the grass. It'll be evaporated before it gets there. So sprinklers aren't your best friend for watering a tree. One of the best for a mature tree is this, a deep root feeder. As you can see, you just pierce it into the ground. And what it does is it just leaches water out to the tip there at a depth. So it's not just gonna be absorbed, it soaks right down and the roots find it. Another great one, and we've got a slide about watering coming up, the soaker hose, run that around your drip line, turn that on and just leave it on on a slow, steady soak for a few hours until that ground absorbs it all. That's a great addition as well, is using, uh, using the soaker hoses. Um, you just literally take your regular garden hose, hook this up to that, and then run it around the tree. You're not watering anything that doesn't need to be watered, you're not wasting water. These guys are great for saving money as well, so you're not wasting water. Uh, we're gonna talk about overwatering and underwatering. Uh, that's coming up but both are equally bad, um, you know, which kind of sounds terrible because it's like, well, if I don't know, do I overwater or underwater? Neither, get it right, okay? <laughs> That's not a great approach if people don't have experience and I don't like that approach. Um, at the end of the day, uh, if you really don't know what you're doing, I would say overwater. Uh, the amount of drainage in uh, soil outside, you're not really going to get a root rot. You're not really going to get much. I mean, you can can turn into a breeding ground for pathogens. Damp soil tends to attract fungus, et cetera, et cetera. But your tree won't die. You don't water your tree for three weeks. It might be dead and there's no coming back from that. You can come back from overwatering. So that's it. But uh, ideally, it's better to not do either. And you might notice you have uh, a number of different trees in your garden and you, you have to give your pear tree, your cherry tree, your apple tree more water. That's because it's producing a big fruit. You bite into an apple, 
what's better, a woody, mealy apple or, a, you know, fat, sassy, juicy apple? Well, we all know what we prefer. That's the amount of water it uptakes. So you may find you need to water them more often from that. And water until frozen. So I said, stop fertilizing, you know, mid-August, beginning of August, whenever. Do not stop watering. Water right up until, even if it's dropped its leaves, but it's still, you know, 10, 11, 12, 18 degrees outside, because uh, we're having, you know, a beautiful late autumn uh, and it's dropped all of its leaves uh, and it's dormant, there's still activity, doesn't hurt to water it. So always keep an eye on that. And then you can see in this slide here, underwatered, easy to spot. Like I said, those leaves are getting crispy. They're getting dry. Your tree is dying. It is literally, it doesn't have the water it needs to sustain itself. Get water on it. But overwatering, we tend not to see that damage because again, it takes a long time. But look at the size of the tree in that picture and look at how shallow that root system is. If you're overwatering, you're never telling those roots to go deep, get away from the hot surface, go and look for water. You're giving them everything. The water is keeping the soil cool. They're staying on the top because they're like, hey, easy drinking here. I'm good. Um, and they're not going deep, which means that tree is very susceptible to come down in a windstorm, a snowstorm. If it gets a massive accumulation of ice on one side, it doesn't have that solid anchor. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen, you know, walking in the forest or even in the neighborhood and a tree's come down, quite often the whole root system is out and it's a very shallow root system. Um, you'll see it a lot on riverbanks, uh, particularly brutal windstorm, a tree comes down on a riverbank. Well, that's because it had easy access to water. Uh, it was literally on a riverbank, so the soil was nice and wet, got all the water it needed, those roots never developed. You start going up into the mountains where those trees are, they're growing in rock. There's not a lot of precipitation. You don't tend to see a ton of trees come down in the mountains. And that's exactly the reason why. And then this slide here is just the correct watering technique. Uh, again, you want to look for the drip line, which is the canopy. So my root wall is where I'm standing now. My drip line is where I'm standing now. So when this tree is planted and mature, Always look for your drip line, which means kind of the outer fringes of your canopy. You don't want to get too far away. If you have to err, err on the side of bringing it just slightly inside, slightly. Ideally, you want to do it. And that's the other great thing about these, you can kind of pattern them. But if you've been pruning for desired shape, taking off what you need, you should have a nice even canopy. That's the ideal growth. Um, and you really want to saturate them. Going out with your hose gun, blasting water on it for two minutes and walking away, it's not really doing much. That water will seep through the rest of the soil. Uh, it'll be evaporated by the warmth and the sun. You really want to drench your trees. And then mulching. And there's any number of mulches. There's colored mulches, there's mulch chips, there's shredded mulch, there's cedar mulch. Doesn't really matter. Mulch helps regulate temperature. So when you have a tree, it's going to have surface roots, even if you water properly. Uh, you don't want those roots getting shocked by, you know, that heat wave we just had. Then it cools off again. Then it gets hot again. Uh, in the winter, no snow coverage, and it drops to minus 20. Those roots are going to feel that. Mulch gives them a layer of insulation. It helps with moisture. Um, again, when you water, it gets into the soil. Well, now there's a barrier between the soil holding the moisture and the sun rays hitting it, so it's not pulling it straight out. The mulch is protecting from that. Helps prevent weeds, we all know that. You put it through your perennial beds, your flower beds, your vegetable beds. Uh, it's great for that. An aesthetic option. A lot of times people go, hey, I can't grow grass into my spruce tree. Um, I've tried every year, okay? And I've, I've learned the hard way too. Maybe sometimes I have to take the hint. I've tried five years to grow grass. I've tried every type of grass. And I've tried dolomitic limes and I've tried watering and it still won't grow. Maybe it's time I change the aesthetic. That's where mulch comes in. It helps amend the soil. It's getting watered. It's absorbing the heat. It's wood. So it's naturally breaking down. You walk through a forest, it's naturally mulch. You dig into it and you get that wonderful layer of soil where it's naturally composted. This is going to do the same thing. 
So it's gonna help you enrich your soil as you go and do not apply too much mulch. I've seen horror stories where people have mulched the tree up to here. Uh, it's gonna cause rot. You're not allowing the gas exchange at the crown. Um, it's gonna hold the moisture as we've already touched on. But now it's holding the moisture to the stem. The mulch is to protect the roots. This doesn't need it. It's got its hardy coat on. It's got its winter coat on. It's like, look at me, I'm protected. I got my armor. Uh, maybe it's not saying it quite like that, but in my head it does. Um, so you don't want to mulch up to here. Uh, you can go deeper around the roots. Just remember, if you put down this much mulch, you're going to have to water more because the water has to get through the mulch into the soil. So just be careful how much mulch you put down. And this last slide here kind of shows that. Volcano bad, crater good. You don't want to woof your mulch like that. You want to come out the other way. So that is going over the roots and you can see the difference in height on that. Uh, just that little two inch layer of mulch is perfect. That's all you need. Again, it's like a fertilizer. More is not necessarily better, less can be more. You're just helping regulate. You're just putting an insulating layer. That's all you're doing. You don't need this much. You put this much and use a water soluble fertilizer, 50% of your fertilizer isn't even gonna get into the soil. It's just gonna live in the mulch. Um, so you really, really wanna be careful putting the mulch down. Done correctly, wonderful thing. Done incorrectly, very negative thing. So uh, that wraps it up. That's uh, tree care for the spring and summer. Uh, a huge thank you uh, to you guys watching this. Uh, we much appreciate it. Uh, we love doing them, uh, no matter how hectic life is. This is a good break. It's always good to interact and have fun. Uh, and we'll open it up if there's any questions.